programme that one James Bogle is listed to speak this morning. I am not James Bogle. <laughs> there are two Bogles in your programme. I'm the one with the hair. <laughs> and, and in fairness, it should be said that Jamie is the one with the greater historical knowledge. And he would add, probably truthfully, more common sense. But that's, you know, he not you know, that. I really do want to apologize for Jamie's absence uh, this morning, and he would very much want me to express his very genuine regret at not being here. The more so because I sent him an email saying I was having a wonderful time and there's a swimming pool and a jacuzzi and a, and a machine that makes coffee in your bedroom and it's really nice, and the most incredibly nice food with pancakes and syrup all on one plate with bacon and everything. <laughs> and everybody's really nice and chic and American, and I feel a bit like a British lump, but you know, there you go. And they're all elegant and really nice and terribly charming, and I'm having a really good time. <laughs> so he probably will feel even crosser now that he's not here, but more seriously, I would like to explain very briefly uh, why he isn't here, because the reason is actually, in a quite extraordinary way, um, relevant to our discussions today. We are talking about the English Reformation. Jamie is not here because the wedding is taking place with some very dear friends of ours. Paola is a very good friend, and we were very pleased, you always are, when you hear about friends uh, getting engaged. But it was a difficulty when we discovered that the wedding was going to be this weekend. The reason that Jamie wanted to go to the wedding, and it's very important that he goes to the wedding, is that Paola is marrying Lord Nicholas Windsor who is a minor member of our royal family. He's in fact the younger son of the Duke and Duchess of Kent. Nicholas Windsor converted to the Catholic faith a few years ago and in doing so renounced his claim to the throne as you have to do under British law. And uh, I don't see he was not a direct heir, if you remember that we do have an heir to the throne who has not become a Catholic as of today's date. <laughs> and uh, he, there's a formality, a formality you have to go through, and he is marrying Paolo, who's a good friend of ours. They will be marrying in the Vatican. And Bishop Alan Hopes, who is a convert from the Anglican faith, is flying out to Rome to celebrate the nuptial mass. If you can't understand what it means to English Catholics that if to, after 400 years there is a royal wedding in the Vatican, <laughs> then no explanation on my part will be able to convey how we feel. So I am here to deliver the lecture that Jamie should have delivered, and it relates to rather less happy times in the history of our wonderful church and of my country. And in doing this, I may say I am relying on the very latest version which Jamie thoughtfully emailed to me and telephoned me to inform about the email at four o'clock this morning, <laughs> which probably seemed like a reasonable time in Rome. <laughs> so, here it is. <laughs> Jamie is a very careful and thoughtful preparer of his speech, so the style that you are about to hear is rather different from the style that you have just been receiving in the last five to seven minutes. <laughs> in making this lecture on behalf of Jamie, I would like also to pay tribute to Monsignor Anthony Conlon, chaplain at the Oratory School at Reading, coincidentally, but perhaps not irrelevantly, founded by the great John Henry Newman, whose excellent lecture on Mary Tudor, given at Winchester, place of her marriage, uh, was a major part, uh, formed a major part of some of the information which you will be hearing. Jamie did a great deal of other research, but I feel that Monsignor Anthony Conlon deserves particular uh, thanks for giving us so much useful information in his lecture to the Catholic Writers Guild two years ago. Please now imagine the rest is said to you in the frankly very attractive voice of my absent husband, um, and imagine that, uh, if you will, uh, that this is uh, now Elizabethan Tudor, Marian, Henrician, England. Ready? Mary Tudor, Queen Mary I, has been portrayed by the history written by Whigs and Protestants as Bloody Mary, the vindictive, heartless, bitter, and fanatical half-sister of the successful and victorious Elizabeth, 
the Gloriana of official history. Yet Queen Mary, daughter of King Henry VIII and Queen Catherine of Aragon, is the queen of whom the Bishop of Winchester spoke so movingly at her funeral oration. She never was unmindful, says the bishop, or uncareful of her promise to her realm. She used singular mercy towards offenders. She used much compassion towards the poor and oppressed. She used clemency among her nobles. She restored more noble houses decayed than ever did prince of this realm, or I pray God ever shall have the like occasion to do hereafter. I verily believe the poorest creature in all this city feared God not more than she. For his pains, the Lord Bishop received next day a message from the new Queen, Elizabeth, that for such offences as he committed in his sermon at the funeral of the late Queen, he was ordered to keep himself prisoner at his own house at the Queen's pleasure. The old order for which the late Queen had stood was never again, apart from a brief period under King James II, to be in favour as it had been during her reign. The direction in which the country was going to be taken would necessarily include the demonizing of her actions and her memory, so that in time both her religion and her reign would become synonymous with foreign domination, coercion, and repugnant religious excesses. All of this would be seen in contrast to the wise and moderate compromise of the Elizabethan settlement that contrived, it was said, to present a middle way allegedly drawing upon both the Catholic and the Calvinistic traditions and capable of satisfying all but fanatics and traitors. Adherence to Catholicism would be regarded as a crime, in many cases ultimately punishable by death, whereas the Protestant victims of the religious policy of Mary's government would be remembered as national martyrs. Those executed under Elizabeth would be portrayed as unpatriotic traitors. William Cobbett, a Protestant writer of the 18th century and erstwhile member of parliament had this to say of the period. The thing called the Reformation was begun in hypocrisy and perfidy and cherished and fed by plunder, devastation and by rivers of innocent and English and Irish blood. The main body of the people were by these doings impoverished and degraded. That's Cobbett. The fear of the Protestant magnates and new men enriched by the plundering of the monasteries, the patrimony of the poor, was that a return to Catholicism might mean the loss of their ill-gotten gains restored to the church. This is the constant theme throughout British history ever since. Will a Catholic king take away our riches and give them back to the monasteries? In fact, neither Queen Mary nor the later Catholic King James II would have been able politically to achieve such an aim. Parliament became the place where the nouveau riche Protestant new men flexed their political muscles and challenged the king's power and the power of the church. Parliament had given the king the right to determine his succession by will, a novel concession that was to have wide implications. Accordingly, he, the king, Henry VIII, chose his son, Edward, that was his son by Jane Seymour, his next wife after Anne Boleyn. She died of puerperal fever. She died in childbirth. And her son was Edward. So Henry VIII designated young Edward, the boy king, as his successor, being the boy first. Then Mary, his daughter by Catherine of Aragon. Then Elizabeth, his possibly illegitimate daughter by Anne Boleyn. Incidentally, his marriage date um, given in as January in the year of Elizabeth's birth it was kept secret at the time and not announced as we've heard until two months later so the people of England didn't know whether the king was was married to Anne Boleyn at the time of Elizabeth's conception. So began a novel power of Parliament to influence the decision as to who would be king a power was later to use to overthrow a king James II purely because he was a Catholic. Even Fox Mary's bitterest enemy allows that Mary's popularity was great. Quote, God so turned the hearts of the people to her and against the council that she overcame them without bloodshed, notwithstanding that there was made great expedition against her both by sea and by land. Edward VI, her brother, was king first and she inherited after him. The proclamation of Mary as queen was rapturously, rapturously received in the capital. A contemporary writer says, great was the triumph here at London. For my part, I never saw the like. 
and by the report of others, the like was never seen. On her entry into the city on August the 3rd, shouts of joy from thousands assembled to greet her were heard on all sides. There was virtually no sympathy for the vanished conspirators against her. It should be noted, however, in the face of those who claim cruelty and vindictiveness as characteristics of Mary, that she exercised the maximum degree of clemency possible for a sovereign in those circumstances and times. Mary was the first English queen regnant. There were therefore no precedents that could be followed. It was both expected and anticipated of her that she should soon mar marry and that her husband, and not she, should reign as well as rule. Her role would then change into being that of mother of an heir. Her mother, Queen Catherine, was the daughter of Isabella of Castile, the Catholic queen who ruled with Ferdinand of Aragon, a ruler in her own right. Both Catherine and Henry, before his fatal entanglement with Anne Boleyn, had educated Mary to the highest level of Renaissance learning, and that had included classical political theory as well as religious writings. It was not lack of determination and decisiveness, but shortness of time and a succession of unfortunate circumstances which robbed Mary of the fruits of many initiatives which she did not live long enough to complete. Mary's coronation in Westminster Abbey on Sunday, October the 1st, was an occasion of great splendor and pomp, with a full Catholic ritual used. Thomas Cranmer, the erstwhile Bishop of Canterbury, being in disgrace, Stephen Gardner, now restored as Bishop of Winchester, performed the coronation ceremony. On October the 5th, the first Parliament of Mary's reign met, quote, to consider chiefly the restoration of religion. Her first priority was the return of her realms to the obedience of the Roman pontiff. By law, this could only be achieved by act of parliament. The bills introduced to bring this about were passed without debate in the Lords, but in the Commons, two members dissented. There was disquiet that the act of supremacy, sorry, the repeal of the act of supremacy would mean restitution of seized church property. Scholarly analysis of Mary's parliaments makes it absolutely clear that religious dissent played very little part in opposition to legislation to restore the Catholic religion. It was concerned that church property might have to be restored to its new, by its new owners that caused the members to hesitate on religious restoration. However, the very parliament that had passed all the laws overthrowing Catholicism retracted them all with very little opposition because they feared the people who loved their new Catholic queen. Meanwhile, the Emperor Charles V proposed his 28-year-old son as a husband for the Queen. To Mary, it must have seemed like a dream come true. She would marry the son of the one ruler who had stood by her through all the years of her tribulation. Remember, this is a young woman whose parents had divorced and who had had a succession of stepmothers and had lived with very considerable difficulty during the years of her growing up, uh, been an object of political intrigue since adolescence. She would also be marrying the grandson of her mother's sister. But it would be wrong to say that she accepted Philip of Spain without any hesitation. She wanted to do what was best for the realm. By the 30th, 31st of October, Mary had made up her mind. Kneeling in a room before the Blessed Sacrament exposed, she pledged to Reynard, the imperial ambassador, that she would marry no other person but Philip. The Venetian ambassador, more objective than either his French or imperial counterparts, describes Mary at this time. Brave and valiant, unlike other timid and spiritless women, but so courageous and resolute that neither in adversity nor in peril did she ever display or commit an act of cowardice or pusillanimity. She kept a wonderful grandeur and dignity, the dignity of a sovereign. Then came Wyatt's rebellion against the marriage, which occasioned so much fear that it would succeed. But the courage of Mary in addressing her councillors and military leaders led to suppression of the rebellion. Even the mendacious Fox, in his Acts and Monuments, had to report the courage of the Queen, reminding the rebels of their lawful descent and royalty of their and their of her sorry loyal descent and royalty and their duty to her. She repudiated all nation of a marriage designed to enslave them. There was fear of a foreign marriage, and that was their ostensible reason, and declared that she would rather live and die a virgin than to marry with any other thought or design than their welfare, concluding with these words. And now, good subjects, pluck up your hearts. 
And like true men, stand fast against these rebels, both our enemies and yours. And fear them not, for I assure you, I fear them nothing at all. God save Queen Mary, reports the local, the contemporary account. They cheered, and 20,000 of them enrolled to defend the city of London. Meanwhile, Wyatt and his rebels eventually managed a crossing of the river at Kingston, and by the 7th of February were at the city gates. At Ludgate, the entrance of the city, he demanded of Lord William Howard, the commander of the Queen's forces, that he be admitted. To which the commander replied, Avaunt, traitor, thou shalt not come in here. And by the evening of the next day, which was Ash Wednesday, Wyatt was defeated and a prisoner. Despite the seriousness of the rebellion, Mary actually exercised extremely generous clemency, only being persuaded by her counsel that some, at least, should suffer execution for the nearly successful rebellion. The Venetian ambassador, again, observes that if Mary had had her way, then none of the rebels would have suffered execution. The royal marriage bill was discussed and passed unanimously by both houses. The Queen dissolved Parliament in person, making a speech that was frequently interrupted by cheers and acclamations. Lords and commons assured her that the Prince of Spain would be welcomed by a dutiful and affectionate people. Now in the strongest possible position, following the defeat of the Wyatt uprising, the Queen was able to conclude the final details for her betrothal and the arrival of Philip in England. The Marquis de la Naves arrived ahead of him to present a collection of splendid jewels to Mary. The Prince travelled from Valladolid on the 4th of May, accompanied by 4,000 picked troops and a concourse of the nobility of Spain together with their wives and attendants. In appearance, the Venetian ambassador describes him as being of medium height, well proportioned and agile. His hair and complexion was entirely Flemish, being fair, but in manners and outlook he was a Spaniard. He was now 27 and a widower was about to embark on his second marriage. The marriage was fixed for the 25th of July, Feast of St. James, patron of Spain. From the announcement in September that the Queen was pregnant, although she continued her official duties, Philip took on more. The story of the pregnancy, which turned out not to be so, but instead the early signs of a critical turn in the health of the Queen is familiar to us. During the time of her supposed pregnancy, with the support of Philip, she embarked with Parliament on that programme of reconciliation with Rome and the restoration of Catholicism with which her reign is closely associated. New light leading to a more positive conclusion has been shed by the work of Dr. Eamon Duffy on the religious situation in his time in his masterly book, already mentioned at this conference, The Stripping of the Altars. The evidence of parish and diocesan records show a marked desire to restore and to replace what had been destroyed. We can see this from parish accounts when Mary's, under Mary's reign, Catholic trimmings were restored to churches where they'd been ripped out. In November of this year of 1554, Cardinal Pole finally arrived in England. On the 28th, he came before Parliament and explained his commission to reconcile the country with Rome. Two days later, at their request, with both houses kneeling before him, he pronounced pardon. During December, Parliament repealed the remaining legislation against the papal jurisdiction in England, and the Pope, in return, validated and legitimized all the sacraments given and received during the time of schism. The bills were passed unanimously. It is to Fox and his Acts and Monuments, a work that made a penniless man a fortune, that we owe most of the detail that has been credited ever since regarding details of the burnings of Mary's reign. Later writers have exposed literally hundreds of lies and inaccuracies in his work, making one doubt there are veracity of much else in it. We need to contrast this with Elizabeth, who put 800 people to death in the first year of her reign for religion alone, nearly as many people as the Spanish Inquisition executed over the whole of its history of 350 years. The history told to prosperity by Whig and Protestant historians is replete with distortions which simply cannot be substantiated. But it is true that some heretics were burnt during Mary's reign, but so was the case in many another monarch's reign, and we must not forget that the punishment for traitors who were women remained in Protestant Britain burning right up to the 1780s. The alleged number of people burned for traitor heresy in Mary's reign is 272, but this figure is disputed 
The saying later was, many who were burnt in Mary's reign drank sack in Elizabeth's. In other words, some of them were not actually burned at the stake. It was a legend. They would turn out to be alive. The real truth about the Protestant martyrs, of whom Fox makes so much, is that they were, says Cobbett, Cobbett, a set of most wicked wretches who sought to destroy the queen and her government and under the pretense of conscience and superior piety to obtain the means of again preying upon the people. No mild means could reclaim her, could reclaim them. But we have to accept that people were burned in Mary's reign. And here, is, here are some of them. Hooper was a monk who broke his vow of celibacy, married a Fleming, and greatly aided the plunder of the church, getting two bishoprics, although he claimed to oppose pluralism, holding more than one bishopric. Latimer, burned in Oxford, as we know, there's a monument to him, began his career not only as a Catholic priest, but as the most furious assailant of the Reformation religion. By this, he obtained from Henry VIII the bishopric of Worcester. He next changed his opinions, but he did not give up his Catholic bishopric. Being suspected, he made abjuration of Protestantism. He thus kept his bishopric for 20 years, while he inwardly opposed the principles of the church and which bishopric he held, and the bishopric he held, in virtue of an oath to oppose, of the utmost of his power, all dissenters from the Catholic Church. In the reigns of Henry and Edward, he sent to the stake Catholics and Protestants for holding opinions which he himself had before held openly or that he held secretly at the time of his so sending them. Ridley had been a Catholic bishop in the reign of Henry VIII when he sent to the stake Catholics who denied the king's supremacy and Protestants who denied transubstantiation. You can see why I'm hesitating. He's Difficult, there's so many people taking two sides at once. In Edward's reign, he was a Protestant bishop and denied transubstantiation himself, and then he sent to the stake Protestants who differed from the creed of Cranmer. He, in Edward's reign, got the bishopric of London by an agreement to transfer the greater part of his possessions to the ministers and courtiers. courtiers. Cobbett says, however, that the greatest villain of them all was Cranmer. Being a fellow of a college at Cambridge and having, of course, made an engagement not to marry while he was a fellow, he did marry secretly and still enjoyed his fellowship. While a married man, he became a priest and took the oath of celibacy. <laughs> Going to Germany, he married another wife, the daughter of a Protestant, so he now had actually two wives at one time, although his oath bound him to have no wife at all. He, as an archbishop, enforced the law of celibacy while he himself secretly kept his German wife in the palace at Canterbury. In fact, he imported her to England in a chest uh, with holes drilled in it. <laughs> he, as ecclesiastical judge, divorced Henry VIII from three of his wives, the grounds of his decision in two cases being directly contrary the contrary of those which he himself had laid down when he declared those marriages to be valid. In the case of Anne Boleyn, he as ecclesiastical judge pronounced that Anne never had been the king's wife, while as a member of the House of Peers he voted for her death as having been an adulteress and thereby guilty of treason to her husband. As Archbishop under Henry, which office he entered upon with a premeditated false oath on his lips, he sent men and women to the stake because they were not Catholics, and he sent Catholics to the stake because they would not acknowledge the king's supremacy and thereby perjure themselves as he, had, as he had so often done. Become openly a Protestant in Edward's reign and openly professing those very principles for the professing of which he had burned others, he now burnt his fellow Protestants because their grounds for protesting were different from his. As executor of the, for the will of his old master, Henry, which gave the crown after Edward to his daughter Mary and then to Elizabeth, he conspired with others to rob both those daughters of their rights and to give the crown to Lady Jane Grey, the Queen of Nine Days, with whom he, with others, ordered to be proclaimed. Brought at last to trial and to condemnation as a heretic, he professed himself ready to recant he was respited for six weeks, during which time he signed six different forms of recantation, each more ample than the former. Brought in the end to execution, and now finding that he must die, he recanted his recantation and thus expired, <laughs> protesting against that very religion which only nine hours before he had called upon God to witness that he firmly believed. 
Mary's hoped for child proved to be a cruel delusion. As the nine months of her pregnancy passed and there was still no sign of labor, the truth became known. By the spring of 1558, it was widely known that there would be no birth. She became ill and removed to St. James from Hampton Court. News came of the deaths, first of the emperor and then of his sister Mary, two people dear to the queen. As Mary's health declined, Philip began to consider the best way forward and to ask Mary to arrange Elizabeth's marriage to a candidate of his choice. Mary was not well enough to consider this, but on advice from Philip, designated Elizabeth as her heir, an action that must surely have cost her more than anything else she had to do in her life. On the November the 17th, Mass was said in her bedchamber, and she answered the responses throughout. She prayed for forgiveness and mercy, and as the Mass ended, lapsed into unconsciousness, from which she never emerged. Elizabeth, during the reign of her brother, had been a Protestant, and during the reign of her sister, a Catholic. At the time of Mary's death, Elizabeth not only went to Mass publicly, but she had a Catholic chapel in her house and also a confessor. These appearances had, however, not deceived her sister, who to the very last doubted her sincerity. On her deathbed, Mary required from Elizabeth a frank avowal of her opinions as to religion. Elizabeth, in answer, prayed God that the earth might open and swallow her if she were not a true Roman Catholic. She made the same declaration to the Duke of Feria, the Spanish envoy, whom she so completely deceived that he wrote to Philip that the accession of Elizabeth would make no alteration in matters of religion. In spite of all this, it was not long before Elizabeth began her brutal campaign of savagery against the very English Catholics of whose number she had falsely sworn herself to be. Mary Tudor.